Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Christine Dobridge. I'm an economist at the Federal Reserve Board, and I'd like to thank you very much for joining us for the first financial literacy seminar of the semester. So we are very pleased today to welcome Sasha Andarte, who will be presenting her work on the impact of social insurance on household debt. Sasha is an assistant professor of finance at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Her primary areas of research are household finance, banking, and macroeconomics. And her current research focuses on the drivers of personal bankruptcy, on the effects of lender asset losses on the credit channel of monetary policy, and on the impact of social insurance on household debt, which we'll be hearing about today. Prior to joining Wharton, she was an assistant professor of finance at Duke University, and she holds a PhD in economics from Northwestern. So just a few housekeeping notes before the seminar. Please submit your questions in the Q&A window, not in the chat window. And I will moderate the questions throughout the seminar and read them to Sasha. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn the floor over. Uh, thank you very much, Sasha, for joining us. All right, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. I'm just gonna go ahead, get the screen shared. Uh, so hopefully uh, the slides are showing. Um, let me know if there's uh, any issues seeing them. Um, so with that, uh, yeah, thanks again. Um, really appreciate the chance to be here and thanks to all of you for joining. The paper I'm presenting, this is joint work with my colleague Gideon Bornstein. So in this paper, we ask, how does expanding social insurance affect households' accumulation of debt? There are multiple channels that shape the relationship between social insurance and household borrowing, but uh, these channels, they can work in opposite directions. So a priori, the total effect of expanding social insurance on household debt is theoretically ambiguous. So what are these different channels? First, there is what we call a direct insurance channel. So when uh, insurance expands, this can reduce the extent to which households rely on debt to cope with adverse shocks, such as uh, income loss or surprise medical expenditures. Now through this channel, we would expect that when insurance expands, that households would, uh, this would result in households having less debt overall. Now in contrast, there can also be a credit demand channel whereby uh, an expansion of insurance reduces households' motives to self-insure through precautionary savings. And, uh, and in doing so, it makes them more willing to take on debt. Uh, so we would expect through that channel, an expansion of insurance would lead to more debt in, uh, in equilibrium. Finally, a third channel is a credit supply channel. So when social insurance becomes more generous, this can make households more financially resilient in the sense that it takes a bigger shock to push a household into default. So when better insured households are less risky, this can make creditors more willing to lend to them. And in equilibrium, the shift in credit supply can then turn into higher overall debt. The goal of this paper is to estimate the total effect of all of these channels on household debt and, uh, and to decompose the role of these different channels. So we're gonna proceed in two steps in this paper. There is first a reduced form empirical part of the paper, and then we're gonna have an, an applied uh, theoretical analysis of a structural general equilibrium model. In the first part, we're gonna estimate the causal effect of expanding Medicaid eligibility on household debt. And what I'm gonna show you today is gonna be empirical results for two different approaches. They're both going to exploit variation in the timing of states' Medicaid expansions. And a second one is going to exploit uh, some relatively new econometric tools uh, that are gonna help take advantage of heterogeneity in the impact of expansions across regions. Now, from these analyses, what we estimate is first, that expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act led to a 2.2% increase in credit card debt for US households. And we find uh, a 1.4% increase in a broader measure of household debt, which is uh, comprised of credit cards, auto debt, and also mortgage debt as well. So this positive effect uh, um, of expanding social insurance on debt, this is consistent with either that credit demand or the credit supply channel that I mentioned before, dominating and being a first order and shaping the equilibrium outcome. So to say more about the channels at play, we then uh, construct a heterogeneous agents model in which households are gonna be subject to medical expenditure shocks. They're gonna be able to borrow and they're also gonna have the option to go delinquent on their debt. 
And in this model, we're going to study the impact of uh, expanding Medicaid. So we're going to simulate this expansion, look at what it does to aggregate debt, the distribution of debt, and decompose its effect into these direct credit demand and credit supply channels. After doing this, what we find is that credit supply is fully responsible for the observed increase in household debt. And we also find that credit supply actually plays an important role in uh, creating the overall welfare benefits of expanding Medicaid. We estimate that uh, this credit supply response accounts for 17% of the total welfare benefits of expanding Medicaid. So just to uh, situate the paper in the literature a bit, uh, we make uh, contributions to several different areas. Uh, first, there is an earlier public finance literature that studies the uh, distributional impact of social insurance. And our main innovation relative to this literature is to consider the role of credit supply, which we end up finding is a very important ingredient for understanding households uh, borrowing outcomes, and in particular, how social insurance affects uh, overall household borrowing. We also build on a more uh, macro, uh, structural macro literature that studies uh, the causes and consequences of household debt accumulation. And one of the big ways in which we differ relative to this literature is that we're going to study variation in uh, how well insured households are. So we're going to vary the extent to which markets are complete versus incomplete and look at what this does to equilibrium uh, debt. Um, we also build on, uh, I would say, well, the paper has some implications for an interesting recent literature that studies the relationship between household debt and the macroeconomy. And uh, what this research finds mainly is that uh, higher debt is associated with a greater risk of macroeconomic crises, and that this is true for household debt uh, in particular. Now, one of the implications from our paper is that sometimes higher debt could be due to something like better social insurance, which could really be a sign that households are more financially resilient. And what our research does is underscore that understanding these different institutional features, such as the size and nature of a country's social safety net is likely important for understanding this relationship between household debt and financial fragility. Uh, finally, we add to a rich applied microliterature that documents a variety of effects of the expansion of Medicaid, for example, documenting reduced delinquency, uh, lower credit card interest rates, and uh, reduced reliance on medical debt and other forms of debt to cope with illness. And relative to this um, applied microliterature, we're adding mainly a uh, focus on general equilibrium and trying to get the total effect of all of these different channels. So uh, this is a, a, the big picture of, of what we're doing in the paper. What I'm next going to do is go over the empirical analysis, which studies the relationship between household debt and credit card debt in particular, and expansions of Medicaid. Um, but if there's any, I guess, uh, clarifying questions right now, uh, Feel free to let me know. Uh, no clarifying questions at this time, thanks. All right. So, um, and just before I show any sort of uh, empirical results or anything like that, I'm going to give a bit of background information on credit card debt and also Medicaid as well. So, why are we focusing on credit card debt in this paper? There are two main reasons for this choice. One is that credit cards are a more natural type of debt to use to smooth consumption in response to adverse shocks. Uh, for example, we wouldn't think someone would go and take out a mortgage or go and take out an auto loan just to cope with, uh, for example, a medical expenditure shock. People would be much more likely to put that on their credit card. The second reason we focus on credit card debt is that it is a really important piece of households total borrowing. Uh, for example, in 2016, according to the SCF, credit card debt actually became uh, the most ubiquitous form of debt with more households having credit card debt than households having debt that was secured by a primary residence. And in terms of overall uh, ubiquity in the population, it beats out auto loans, education loans, other installment loans, and other real estate related loans as well. Now, in terms of its overall scale, uh, households um, yeah, as of 2019 held just under a trillion dollars in credit card balances, which works out to be just over about $7,000 per household. Now, in terms of the uh, flow of interest payments that households make, it's actually quite substantial for credit card debt. In 2019, commercial banks earned about $90 billion in uh, interest income from credit cards alone, which isn't too far, it's the same order of magnitude as what they earn from mortgages. So this is actually a really important cost in terms of the interest payments that households are making. 
Now, one of the reason those interest payments are quite large is that uh, credit cards have uh, relatively high interest rates. The average APR is 14%, and the legal maximum in the US is 36%. Now, one other uh, piece of motivating evidence that we document in this paper is the relationship between credit card borrowing and household income. So here on the y-axis, we have uh, the probability, or rather the, the fraction of households that have a credit card debt and uh, how this varies with their income. And what we see here is a hump-shaped relationship. So at low levels of income, as income begins to increase, households are more likely to have a credit card. And eventually, as income gets sufficiently high, the nature of that relationship changes, they start to be less likely to have a credit card. Now, what's striking about this is that this upward slope, sloping portion, this is at odds with standard incomplete market models. In, uh, for example, a typical Iagari model, it's these low income states of the world in which you want to have debt, because that's going to help you smooth your consumption as your income fluctuates around. So these are the households that we would expect to have the most demand for debt, but in equilibrium, we observe them having the least debt. Now, what could be going on here? Credit supply could be responding to differences in these households. Namely, if these low-income households are much more likely to default, creditors are gonna be less willing to lend to them or only do so at really, really high interest rates. And in equilibrium, that would lead to uh, less credit card debt overall. So the fact that we see this uh, strong upward sloping portion, what this suggests is that credit supply is first order in shaping equilibrium debt outcomes. So what this suggests is if we want to have a model and framework to understand the causal effect of various policy changes on household debt, understanding how and if uh, credit supply responds to those changes is likely going to be very important. Sasha, I have a, we have one clarifying question about this chart. So does this chart show balances um, balances outstanding people that maintain a balance for, for months or longer uh, and as opposed to people that pay off their credit card um, regularly every month? Yes, that's, that's an important question. So what we are looking at here is uh, actual credit card debt and not just balances. So this is coming from the PSID. And one caveat here is that this is coming from a question where uh, it is asked how much is going unpaid on their credit card or how much is, there's one about how much is going unpaid and whether they have any portion of their credit card balance that's going unpaid. So from that, we can infer uh, if they actually have credit card debt. Um, you know, given the nature that this is a survey, I think, you know, the usual sorts of survey caveats apply, but uh, yes, this uh, should correspond to, to debt rather than balances. Thank you. Any, any other questions about credit cards or? Uh, no questions at this time, but if anyone has questions, uh, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. Thank you. All right. Um, now I'll give uh, what I'm going to do next is give some background on Medicaid as well. So Medicaid is a government program that is administered by the states and it provides health insurance to low income households. It's an overall very important source of health insurance. There were about 65 million Americans that were receiving their health insurance through Medicaid in 2019. And this actually grew uh, substantially uh, during uh, the, the, the pandemic, um, up to around uh, 80 million Americans uh, receiving insurance through Medicaid. Uh, now, Medicaid, one reason that we focus on it is that it's, uh, it's not only just a large part of the social safety net in the US, but it's also a piece of the safety net that has undergone some of the most dramatic changes in recent years. This is mainly due to the Affordable Care Act, or ACA. The ACA, what it did was it uh, set out to provide federal funding for state expansions of Medicaid eligibility in 2014. Now, in 2012, there was a Supreme Court ruling that ultimately made take up of the expansion optional. Now, what did this mean uh, for the expansion of Medicaid? What it resulted in was a staggered expansion across states. So there were a couple early adopters like Minnesota and California, for example. There were a number of states like uh, Iowa and Illinois that expanded in 2014 right on schedule. Uh, there are some states like Pennsylvania that took a, a year to expand. And then uh, continually, we've been seeing a number of states gradually start to opt in to the expansion. And there are still ongoing uh, ballot measures and efforts to get more states to opt into the Medicaid expansion. Now, uh, for the empirical analysis, I'm going to show you uh, results from two different empirical strategies. The first strategy is going to be an instrumental variable strategy that exploits the staggered timing of expansions. 
And this is going to be something kind of more off the shelf. It's uh, essentially a conventional strategy that a lot of economists have used to study the impact of Medicaid expansions. And uh, the second strategy is going to use a more recent uh, methodological innovation uh, for simulated instrumental variables from Borussiak and Hall. So I'll use this recentered ID, which is going to allow me to exploit a uh, much richer variation in the effect of Medicaid expansions. Now for this first strategy, there's some pros and there's some cons. So the pro is that uh, currently I'm actually, everything I'm going to show you is with public, uh, publicly available data. We're going to, we're in the process of getting and analyzing uh, much more detailed credit bureau data. But for now, uh, if we want to have credit card uh, outcomes, we're only going to be able to get this in public data at the state level from the New York Fed Consumer Credit Panel. Now, this is a limitation because this uh, we're only going to have so many observations because this is a state level analysis, um, but it's going to allow us to look at credit cards, which is the main uh, type of debt we think is going to uh, respond. Now, for the, this first strategy, the identifying assumption is going to be that the timing of the expansions, conditional on the state and the year, is as good as random. Now for this uh, recentered simulated ID strategy, what it's gonna allow us to do is do something more granular. So what we're gonna do is a, a county level analysis. And uh, we're also, one of the other big reasons for using this simulated ID is the potential efficiency gains. So this recentered simulated ID has the potential to give you a much more precise estimate through better efficiency. Now, what are some of the downsides here? So we don't have credit card outcomes at the county level, but we do have measures of household debt to income at the county level. So this is going to have credit cards, but also mortgages and auto loans lumped in there as well. And we're going to make a different identifying assumption for the second strategy. So what's, uh, there's going to be really two key assumptions. One is that the path of policies for eligibility that are realized within states has some known, dis known distribution. So we know the counterfactual distribution of what policies could have realized in Iowa versus Pennsylvania versus Massachusetts and so on. So that's the first key assumption. But then we're also going to assume that uh, the realized path is random within some subset of states. Specifically, if you lived in a state that was primarily governed by a Democratic governor, uh, during the sample period in which we were looking, those other democratically governed states are going to be your counterfactual Medicaid histories uh, because uh, the, the party of the governor ended up ultimately being really important for determining which states expanded and which ones didn't. So this is going to allow us to allow for there to be non-random selection across Democratic and Republican states, but within these states we're going to assume that it's essentially like drawing marbles from a bag within the Democratic states. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do next is go over the results uh, from the first empirical strategy, but any, and I'll talk about the second strategy in, in a bit more detail soon, but any questions would be useful to answer now? Yes, one question we have is that another potential strategy um, that, that one, could, one could use uh, could be a difference in differences strategy, taking advantage of the, um, the state level changes. Can you talk about why you prefer the IV strategies? Yeah, so we've um, we've done a version of a difference in difference strategy. Uh, one of the challenges of doing a difference in difference strategy is sometimes the interpretation of the coefficients. So there's been this recent literature, uh, econometric literature, that's documented a lot of limitations. Uh, so sometimes, like when you have heterogeneity in um, or non-constant treatment effects over time, and you try and use these staggered timing settings, that can put kind of strange weights on. Uh, on the various treatment effects. And when you get that aggregate treatment effect, it can do weird things like even flipping the sign of the treatment effect. So there's some interpretation issues and there are also some more recent tools that can potentially help overcome that. But our big reason for preferring this, uh, the IV strategy is uh, in addition to not having the same interpretation issues, it's uh, potentially going to have a lot of efficiency gains and really allow us to leverage. Uh, uh, what's nice about it is that we can make an assumption about state level, what kind of state level variation is driving things, but we can exploit much more granular variation for identification. So potentially there's a lot of power gains here, even compared to the diff and diff strategy. Thank you. So another question we have is, are you able to look at other credit outcomes like delinquencies or credit scores? So not yet, um, but we're, uh, actually, I think I have one more bullet here about this. So uh, what's in the works is uh, the ink is now dry on a contract with Experian to get uh, a sample of um, uh, 10 million households 
um, their credit uh, their credit borrowing outcomes, and we're going to do a zip level zip code level version of this recentered simulated IB, and we're going to have a rich array of debt outcomes. We're going to also be able to see uh, credit scores uh, and uh, utilization on credit cards, credit limits, and uh, um, uh, inquiries for credit cards. So uh, we're hoping that'll also help us say a little bit more about corroborating what we find in the model with regard to supply versus demand. Okay, thank you. Uh, no more questions right now. All right. So here uh, I'm showing uh, a table that describes the results from the state level analysis. In the first two columns, I have uh, estimates from two stage least, uh, the two stage least squares estimation that exploits the staggered timing. So the specification in this box on the right is the one that I'm estimating. On the left hand side, I have uh, the log of per capita uh, credit card borrowing uh, in uh, state S at time T. And I'm interested in estimating the causal effect of a percent of, a, of a, the fraction of the population that has a health insurance uh, on that credit card borrowing. And I'm gonna instrument for uh, the fraction that has insurance with an indicator for whether or not the state has adopted the Medicaid expansion. So uh, with this IV, what we estimate is that there's a positive effect on credit card debt of increased insurance. What the coefficient means is that a one percentage point increase in the insured share of the population leads to a slightly bigger than 1% increase in households credit card debt. And uh, we're adding controls, uh, additional uh, state and state and time varying controls as we go to the second column. And just by means of comparison, if you just do the naive OLS estimation of this equation here, you find something dramatically different. So you would find uh, a, a non-significant and coefficient-wise, uh, essentially a zero effect of insurance uh, on, on household uh, credit outcomes. Now, just to, um, to help think about the magnitude here, uh, so expanding Medicaid, uh, if we multiply the, the first and second stage here, because the first stage is telling us about the implied effect of adopting on uh, the insured share of the population, what this implies is that expanding Medicaid led to a 2.2 percentage point increase in households' credit card debt. Relative to the stock of credit card debt outstanding, this corresponds to about a $20 billion increase in overall credit card debt. Now, one of the reasons we want to show that strategy is just to have a more apples apples to, uh, comparison with other papers that have used that kind of strategy, but study different outcomes. What I'm going to go over next is uh, more recently, uh, uh, in, it's a strategy that uh, kind of revisits an older method uh, originally developed by uh, Curry and Gruber and uh, proposes a new way to implement it to get a lot of a nice uh, improved econometric properties. So the goal for the county level analysis with this recentered simulated IV is to estimate the causal effect of an increase in the fraction of the population eligible for Medicaid on county level debt to income ratios. Now, identification wise, uh, what we would be worried about from uh, if we, we thought to just run the naive OLS regression would be that exposure to the Medicaid expansion is non-random. So you're more likely a zip code, for example, that has a lot of low income people that had a lot of non-parents, they're gonna be much more exposed because uh, it's the low income people that are at the margin of becoming eligible. And a big part of the ACA expansion was to open up Medicaid to people that, did, uh, that didn't have dependents as well. So counties that saw bigger increases in eligibility, they're gonna be different in probably other ways that also affect their access and uh, demand for, uh, for household debt. So the solution we adopt is a recentered simulated IV. Now, uh, the way this works is uh, the following. We're going to make an assumption uh, about uh, the, uh, the uh, counterfactual distribution of Medicaid eligibility rules. So we're going to assume uh, that state's history of eligibility rules, so the whole path of those rules, is drawn from some known distribution. So for example, Minnesota and California, these are both primarily democratically governed states over our sample period. And uh, we're going to assume that, uh, uh, that California or Minnesota could have adopted each other's approaches to Medicaid, but it's unlikely, for example, that Alabama and Arkansas would have adopted California and Minnesota, but perhaps Alabama and Arkansas would have had more similar policy realizations. So we're going to have these two distinct groups. Now, after specifying this distribution of counterfactual eligibility rules, we then can simulate and calculate permutations of all of the possible realizations of uh, even at the person level, a person's eligibility for Medicaid under different state policies. 
And once we calculate this at every point in the support for this distribution of potential policies, we can then estimate or rather calculate someone's propensity to be eligible for Medicaid uh, at a given point in time. And we're going to call this a uh, propensity mu here. So this is uh, the idea is that this is the average uh, eligibility that this person living in a primarily democratic governed state versus a Republican governed state, uh, their average propensity to be eligible for Medicaid. Now, the way the, um, the recentered simulated IV is constructed is that we take our endogenous variable here, eligibility, and we subtract out this propensity to be eligible for Medicaid. And the idea is that we're here uh, netting out this, uh, 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 the variety of factors that go into someone tending to be eligible for Medicaid. Now, one reason that this is valuable is that uh, eligibility for Medicaid, it's a, it's a complicated multidimensional rule. It depends on your income. It depends on the state that you're in. It depends on your family size and family structure. And it's hard to kind of fully nonlinearly control for all of those things. And calculating this propensity is a neat way to summarize all of those different components and then account for it. Now, something that you can do is you can use this as an IV and I'll show you results for both, uh, but you can also uh, just use eligibility in the regression and then control for this propensity. And the latter is gonna be my preferred specification because there's actually efficiency gains from uh, that control approach versus uh, the recentered uh, versus directly doing the two stage least squares estimation. So intuitively, we should think of this uh, mu term, this propensity as accounting for this person's uh, or county or zip code's propensity to be exposed to higher eligibility. And this instrument is capturing this excess eligibility due to the random realization of, for example, California being much more generous than Minnesota. All right, any, any questions on, on the, the IV or the approach? Uh, no questions on the IV. All right. Uh, so formally, what am I going to estimate? So this is uh, the second stage uh, equation for the two stage uh, least squares estimation. I'm interested in the causal effect of a percentage change in the eligible uh, population for Medicaid on, uh, on DTI. So this is the debt to income ratio for a county I at some time T. And I'm also going to flexibly allow for this to differ for uh, counties that are low income, which here corresponds to below median income counties. And one reason for that is most of the effect, perhaps not surprisingly, is going to be uh, account, it's going to play out in these low income counties. So uh, I'll first show you results that instrument for eligibility uh, and its interaction using instruments constructed from uh, this recentered IV where we're netting out this propensity to tend to be eligible. And the key identifying assumption is going to be uh, exchangeability of eligibility rules within Democratic versus Republican governed states. Now, alternatively, as I mentioned, we can also do this directly with controls. So I'll also show you results from a version where we just put in uh, control and then the corresponding interaction for this propensity as well. So first, I'm going to show you um, results from the first stage. So we have uh, two outcome variables. We have eligibility and then eligibility's uh, interaction with whether or not a county is low income. And uh, what we see is that, uh, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, that places that have a higher propensity to be eligible overall are much more likely to have eligible people. And if this was uh, uh, equal to one, what that would mean is that uh, these uh, state level uh, changes uh, in the state level realization of which policy uh, actually occurred for Medicaid determines, uh, uh, if it was equal to one, it would imply that it, it, it fully determines whether or not someone is eligible. So that extra 3% is coming from other idiosyncrasies. And we see a similarly high value uh, for the interacted term as well. One thing you'll notice is that low income, and uh, so this indicator for low income is uh, positively associated with eligibility. Similarly, log average income within the county is negatively associated with eligibility. So just as we conjectured, uh, low income places just tend to have more eligibility overall. Now here, we're looking at the second stage result, and we don't see a statistically significant or really a large effect for the high income counties uh, of an increase in eligibility. But for the low income counties, we see a large uh, uh, positive effect and it's statistically significant. So what this point estimate, for example, in the third column means is that a one percentage point increase in eligibility is associated in, in a low income county is associated with about a one percentage point 
uh, increase in uh, uh, households uh, DTI. So the DTI is rising by just under a percentage point. And, uh, oh, and we'll also see here that uh, low income is associated with um, less uh, debt overall, similar to what we saw with that hump-shaped graph from before, and having higher income just uh, in this more flexible version with the log average income uh, is also associated with a higher BTI. Now, when we do the control version, uh, one reason I like to, to look at both of these um, is that if you look at this estimate on uh, this propensity, uh, what it's telling us is that these places that tend to have a high propensity to uh, uh, have a big, have a change in eligibility in response to uh, changes in Medicaid rules, these tend to be places that uh, have lower debt overall, so a lower DTI. But when we uh, have uh, uh, this exogenous uh, shock in eligibility coming from the random realization of the state's policy, we see that this implies that a one percentage point increase in uh, households uh, in the eligible fraction of the population implies uh, a 0.8 percentage point increase in uh, the overall DTI. Now, just to get a sense of magnitudes and get some more kind of macro numbers, uh, elsewhere in the paper, we estimate that expanding Medicaid increased eligibility uh, six, uh, about six percentage points. Now, multiplying that by our estimate here for these low-income folks that responded, um, this implies a uh, five percentage point increase in DTI for this bottom 50% in the income group. So assuming that all the responses working through this bottom percent for aggregate household debt, this implies an increase of 1.4 percentage points in, uh, in total household debt in the US. So again, we're finding a positive overall effect on debt here. The last uh, empirical result that I wanna show is I'm uh, actually gonna zoom way out and we're not gonna talk about causality here, but I think it's a nice piece of motivating evidence. What we're looking at here is uh, debt to uh, GDP ratios across countries and we're plotting it against the share of health expenditures that are covered by the government. So further to the right, we wanna think of that as countries that have more social insurance. And what do we see here is that the countries such as Denmark and Norway that have the most generous social safety nets, that's precisely where you see the households that accumulate the most debt overall. Uh, places like the US, which are kind of more in the middle, they have a more moderate level of debt. And then once we get down to Brazil, Mexico and India, we start to see less household debt overall. So in, uh, if we look across countries, this is suggestive that uh, part of uh, the social safety net uh, could be contributing to improved financial resilience and enabling households to take on more debt. Now, what I'm gonna do next is uh, turn to the model, but if there are any questions about the empirical part, uh, this would be a good time. Yes, we do have a couple questions about the, um, the magnitude of, of the results. Um, so the first question is, can you discuss the magnitude and direction of the results as they relate to the microeconomics literature regarding Medicaid expansions? For example, the work by Hu et al. and Miller et al. Um, so I don't, I don't recall them looking at, I think, yeah, off the top of my head, I, I don't have like a precise sense of a, uh, their magnitude. So I think I couldn't do a, a very neat comparison. I think one thing I'll add is that, uh, you know, 1% maybe at the macro level sounds uh, a bit small, but given that this is coming from the bottom 50%, which sometimes, you know, some macroeconomists might tell you that they probably can't explain much of the aggregate variation. I think it's pretty striking that an intervention that's mainly affecting this group could lead to this 1% increase. And I would find 1% to be within uh, the realm of, of uh, what's plausible here. Now, in terms of, um, I know the WHO paper, they also focus on, uh, I know medical debt is uh, one of the outcomes uh, that they look at. And uh, I believe, if I, yeah, um, yeah, the analyses of the effect of the expansion on medical debt, it finds something in the opposite direction, which is, shouldn't be surprising. If people are going from being uninsured and they would have otherwise incurred medical debt, uh, then they should have less medical debt if they now have access to Medicaid. So here we're focusing on uh, the private, uh, 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 these other sources of debt outside of medical debt that you would get to like a private lender. Okay, thank you. So related to that, um, do you have any data on what fraction of Medicaid recipients have credit cards? And have you calculated any estimates of the dollar value of the debt increase per Medicaid recipient? Um, do you think that the, the, the results are really coming from Medicaid recipients or are they broader to uh, encompass people kind of close to the Medicaid edge or or even farther away? 
That's an excellent question. So we don't have, you would need person level data, I think, to properly address that, to, uh, to have this person in the credit bureau records and know that they were eligible for Medicaid, which is uh, going to be difficult to do. Even if you have their income, you would have to know their family size. So I don't think we're going to be able to directly, you know, split our sample into Medicaid, non-Medicaid folks. We're just going to be able to look at counties with different levels of eligibility, but we can also look at um, uh, the impact through actual enrollment. And we've done some take-up estimations and we find uh, that uh, there's about 20% take-up. So you basically would want to uh, divide uh, by five, or I guess multiply by five, uh, to think about the impact of uh, expanded, if we think that it's all coming from the people taking it up. But it's also not obvious if it would just come from the people taking it up, uh, because I might know that maybe I'm low income, but not low enough income to qualify for Medicaid, but I know that there's a chance that I have a bad shock and I might become eligible, you know, at least I would be eligible for Medicaid in that bad state of the world. If creditors recognize that, and if I recognize that, even if I'm not eligible yet, but my chances of being eligible in the future are better, that could also affect equilibrium borrowing. So I think to you know, see if both of those channels are at play, that would be a really interesting research question, but we're not gonna be able to disentangle that at least directly in the data. But actually, the, that's something the model is also uh, helpful for as well. So we could do that uh, analysis in the model to try and say how much is coming from potential eligibility versus actual eligibility or act actual take up of Medicaid. Okay, thank you. Um, just just a couple other things, and then we want to give you enough time to talk to the model about the model. Certainly, um, can you use survey data to look at lending for other loan types? You mentioned that you are going to be using Experian data. Have you thought about survey data? Would you expect that payday lending, in particular, declines because that's a costly way to cover medical shocks? Yes. Yeah, so actually, um, Jalan Wang and Tal Gross, and I, I might be forgetting a couple of other co-authors. They have a paper. I believe it's in health affairs that looks at the effect. Uh, they use the first empirical strategy, well, a version of the first empirical strategy, and they find that expanding Medicaid did reduce payday lending. So I think that that extremely costly form of credit, uh, I think part of what could have happened is that if households are now able to qualify for something like a credit card that is much less expensive than a payday loan, there could be substitution between those forms of unsecured credit. Okay, thank you. And then just a quick clarifying question on the um, the cross-sectional chart showing the different country trends. Does that show uh, total household debt or credit card debt specifically? It's a measure of total household debt. So credit card and mortgages should be in there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's it for now. All right. So in the last uh, six minutes or so, um, I'll give an overview of what we do in the model. So the setting is the following. Uh, we're going to have a heter heterogeneous agents economy, and agents are going to be subject to income shocks. They're going to face uh, a compound Poisson process, uh, meaning that with some probability lambda, they're going to have a change in their income, and there's going to be a persistent component of the income, and then there's going to be uh, a new shock to their overall income. Now, households are also going to face medical expenditure shocks in our model. So these medical expenditure shocks, X, are going to come from a log normal distribution, which is actually approximately how the, the distribution of medical expenditures does look in the US. And uh, households, if um, they're not going to be fully responsible uh, for this medical expenditure. When they're insured, their actual out-of-pocket expense, which uh, we're going to model having insurance through your income with a function here, uh, when you're insured, that reduces your overall out-of-pocket expenditures. So uh, these uh, M ends up being what you actually pay when you have a medical shock. Now, on uh, the credit side of the economy, households are going to be able to borrow or save using one period securities B. And they can choose to go delinquent on this debt. Um, and if they do so, there's going to be a disutility penalty uh, from doing that, which is, um, for example, something my job market paper, which studies bankruptcy, suggests is an important deterrent for households' uh, default decisions. Uh, they're going to suffer that disutility cost. Now, they're also going to pay an endogenous interest rate that's going to depend on both their income and how much debt that they have, and ultimately on the nature of the social safety net as well. Now, uh, how is delinquency and credit supply going to work in this model? So households, uh, they can go delinquent, and what that looks like in our model is you stop making payments on your debt. Now, in contrast to other models, when you default this way, your debt does not disappear. So it sticks around, which is more realistically what delinquency actually looks like for a lot of households. Now, when our households go delinquent, they're not going to save or borrow. They're just going to be kind of stuck with this amount of debt. 
And if they have bad luck, medical expenditures, if they occur, they're going to continue to pile up on that debt. So that debt can continue to grow even when you're delinquent as a result of medical bills. Now, how do households get out of uh, delinquency? Uh, we're going to have basically a reduced form of approximation of bankruptcy or some of the bilateral renegotiation that happens with hospitals, where with some probability, a stochastic fraction of the household's debt is going to be forgiven. And if enough is forgiven, that's going to help them cure their delinquency and get out of delinquency. So this helps us get uh, dynamics where households can be very persistently indebted. Now, um, on the credit supply side, we're just going to assume perfect competition among lenders. One of the other really cool features of our model is uh, because of uh, how we're modeling delinquency, debt in this economy is really going to be a hybrid of short-term and long-term debt. It's short-term in the sense that literally it's a one-period bond, but it's long-term in the sense that creditors and borrowers understand that there's a chance the borrower goes delinquent and has that debt for a longer time, and they maybe only get a partial recovery depending on uh, what happens in this debt forgiveness process. Now, uh, I want to zoom in on the household's uh, uh, borrowing decision to see the different channels at play. So when we think about, when we simulate the uh, expansion of insurance in this model, it's going to raise uh, households' disposable resources in these bad states of the world. And uh, the extent to which households were uh, using debt to cope with adverse shocks, uh, now that they have these extra resources in their budget set in those bad states of the world, that most directly leads to, uh, to less debt. Now to see the other indirect channels, uh, we're gonna look at their first order condition. So the left-hand side has the marginal benefit of borrowing. Uh, the right-hand side has the marginal, uh, the marginal cost of borrowing. Now looking at the different components here. So uh, the cost of borrowing is what you have to give up in the future uh, if, if you take out uh, a loan today. And when we expand social insurance that reduces the variability of these medical expenditure shocks, and that is gonna to lead uh, to more uh, debt overall. So households have less uh, variability. They're, uh, they're less likely to end up in these places where there's a lot of curvature in their utility function. So that reduces their precautionary savings motive. Now, we're also gonna have um, something that also works through this credit demand channel that we call a debt aversion motive. So when Medicaid expands, it improves households' financial resilience. You default less often. Now, when you default less often, you care more about the interest rate. If I knew I was never going to repay my debt, the interest rate could be a million percent. I don't care what it is, but you're going to be much more sensitive if you actually become more likely to repay your debt. So this can actually have another effect uh, that pushes in the opposite direction, where expanding insurance means that you're repaying more often, you're more sensitive to the price, so that leads to potentially less debt in equilibrium. The last channel is the credit supply channel. So when uh, households have this reduction in their default risk, Creditors are also happier, and when they're doing this risk-based pricing, they're going to offer households more favorable credit terms. So that means that you're able to borrow more uh, for a given amount of what you're promising to repay in the future. Uh, and in equilibrium, these better terms, uh, the shift in credit supply is going to lead to more debt for the household. Now, uh, just to um, uh, explain the information that we use to simulate the expansion of Medicaid, we're going to um, uh, use the medical expenditure panel survey. This gives us detailed information on the distribution of medical expenditures, its joint distribution with insurance, uh, the type of insurance people have, income, and the size of their out-of-pocket expenditures. And we're also going to use these measures of credit card debt, um, specifically not, uh, not balances, but, but debt, from the PSID to calibrate to this uh, hump-shaped uh, distribution uh, or hump-shaped uh, uh, pattern of credit card borrowing with respect to income. And I'll just skip over some of those, um, some features of the model and just summarize the main thought experiment. So in the model, we simulate expanding Medi uh, the Medicaid expansion um, by raising Medicaid coverage 1.6 percentage points, uh, which is the estimated uh, effect of the, of, uh, the policy on actual take up. And we're gonna decompose these channels. So again, this insurance channel, these medical shocks are less costly, credit demand, it's working through precautionary savings and that debt aversion channel, and there's credit supply. And uh, when we look at the total impact of the Medicaid expansion in the model, uh, we end up seeing that it implies a 1.3 percentage point increase in household credit card debt. Now, one of the things I want to highlight is we're not targeting this parameter. It ended up uh, actually just happening to be similar to what we estimate in the data. So this gives us some reassurance that the model is doing a good job simulating the expansion uh, of Medicaid and how it affects uh, household debt. Now, the implied welfare gain 
is uh, this is uh, means that expanding Medicaid was equivalent to a 18 basis point increase, uh, permanent increase in consumption for households for the rest of their life. So quantitatively, this is a significant benefit. Decomposing the role of the channels, uh, we see that uh, in terms of what, what's driving the debt response, uh, the direct effect as expected is to reduce uh, uh, credit card debt. When we look at demand, it actually ends up being that this debt aversion channel is very powerful and that reduces uh, households debt further. But there's a very strong credit supply response. And what this means is that credit supply is therefore fully responsible for the uh, increase in credit card debt in the model. Looking at welfare, most of uh, the welfare benefit is coming from this direct effect. Now that shouldn't be surprising because we're basically giving a gift to households in high marginal utility states of the world when we expand insurance. But credit supply ends up accounting for a non-trivial portion as well. So the benefit of the credit supply response corresponds to about a 17% 17, 17 of the overall welfare gains. So what this indicates is that credit supply is important for mediating the relationship between uh, social insurance and household debt, and it's an important piece of the total welfare gains of expanding insurance. Uh, just to wrap up, uh, we look at the relationship between social insurance and household debt. We document a positive uh, effect of expanding insurance on uh, credit card debt and overall household debt. In the model, we see that credit supply drives this rise in debt, and it leads to first order welfare gains. Big picture, uh, what we're seeing here is uh, an example of how social insurance can crowd in private insurance rather than crowding it out. Specifically, uh, households' ability to self-insure through credit access, and it can lead to overall large welfare gains. So with that, uh, I'll stop here and open up for more questions. Good, thank you very much. Um, if anyone has questions, please go ahead and submit them to the Q&A window. Uh, so one question for you is, how would you expand the model to incorporate different types of debt? Um, do you think there are different effects for, for different types of debt, uh, such as mortgage debt or auto loan debt? Um, our current plan actually is, uh, we think it's maybe beyond the scope of this particular paper to study those other types of debt. And it's precisely because mortgage debt, auto debt, uh, we, we expect that those would respond differently to this change. So what's kind of special about credit card debt is that it's a more natural tool for smoothing your consumption in response to adverse shocks. Now, what I would uh, hypothesize is that households are gonna see improved FICO scores um, as a result of their improved financial resilience. That'll help them become homeowners faster, maybe even get a larger mortgage. It'll help them get an auto loan. So I would expect a positive effect, probably a more slow moving effect, but I would think it would matter for those uh, credit categories. But I think it would just be very different because the credit demand channel would be, uh, the what's driving the demand is different. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question. So uh, what about the preference parameters in the model? Are the results sensitive to assumptions about risk aversion and debt aversion? Um, let's see. So in our calibration, let's see if I can, I have this in the, the slide here. Um, yeah, actually, so our risk aversion parameter, we're taking, um, that, that one is not one of the targets in our calibration. We're taking one of the standard parameters uh, from the literature. Off the top of my head, I don't recall uh, what sensitivity tests uh, looked like, but uh, that would definitely be a valuable type of sensitivity analysis to do because the nature of that risk aversion and to the extent that you know it's affecting your intertemporal preferences as well, uh, it should matter for the, the credit demand channel. Okay. Um, also, can you explain a little bit more about the estimation of the model and how you use uh, how you use the medical expenditure data and the PSID data, um, and do you use the individual level data for the estimation? Um, yeah, um, I think it might be, I have a bit more of this in our appendix. So I'll try and uh, screen share this. So like, actually, I'll just jump back here a little bit. Um, so as I mentioned, there's two main data sources that we're using in the calibration. So um, 
one uh, of the, the ones that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting here is the medical expenditure panel survey. So the panel dimension of this is really nice. Uh, and then you have rich information about income, medical expenditures, out-of-pocket expenditures. And we can see for people on uh, private insurance. So for example, one of the moments that we use is uh, um, how insurance coverage uh, varies with the uh, income distribution, the type of insurance that you have, how your out-of-pocket expenditures vary with income for the different type of insurance uh, you have as well. And we also, from the medical expenditure panel survey, uh, this is what we use. Uh, so here in um, the blue uh, solid part, we have the actual data on what the distribution of households medical expenditures uh, look like. And we're just taking the log here just because of the, the scale of the distribution. As you'll see, it's approximately log normal. And then we just fit a, a log normal to this to use this to calibrate these uh, expenditure shocks. And yes, uh, so here um, we're looking at the percentage of people that have Medicaid and how that varies uh, with income. And we can also see the percent of people that have some other kind of insurance that is not Medicaid. And then the omitted category here is the uninsured population. And uh, with this, we can then uh, have an out-of-pocket expenditure function uh, that's a function of income. Uh, so we look at you know, your probability of having Medicaid versus not Medicaid versus being uninsured. And those populations, they have different out-of-pocket expenditures being covered. So Medicaid, they tend to pay a very small fraction of out-of-pocket expenses. They pay about six uh, or 7%. If you have private insurance, you're typically paying between 25 and 30%. And uninsured, they typically pay uh, 60%. So keep in mind, they don't always end up uh, actually paying. And then sometimes there's a negotiation with uninsured, pa uh, uninsured uh, uh, patients. So this is uh, what we're doing to calibrate this uh, out-of-pocket expenditure uh, process. And then we're, um, uh, for the other parameters, uh, we're uh, choosing them to best uh, fit. Let's see, I think oh, it was back before, uh, to be best fit this distribution. So here, this is a different object from the PSID. It's the actual um, credit card uh, debt as a percent of median income in the PSID. And we figured that that would be, um, our model doesn't really have like a notion of not borrowing. Um, uh, so just to, because it's more of a, it's a continuous model, it's uh, more sensible to try and fit that to the actual amount of credit card borrowing and how it varies with the income distribution. So we have several different moments here and that helps us, we then choose uh, the remaining parameters uh, in order to, uh, uh, to best fit uh, uh, to best fit the model uh, to that observed empirical distribution. So that's coming from this that that speaks to the haircut process and the income process mainly. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a question about if you can tell us a little bit more about this new IV method, uh, perhaps you know what type of questions it's the most applicable to and how difficult it is uh, for how difficult it is labor intensive to implement? So I think it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a method I'm very excited about. So the, the main reference for this is Borussiak and Hall. They have a 20, uh, 2021 paper, I believe it's R&R &R at Econometrica right now. Um, it's useful for a lot of different uh, uh, situations. There's kind of two different problems it can potentially solve. So they, and they illustrate this with two really nice applications in their paper. So one is to Medicaid. And so we follow something in the spirit of what they do. And uh, then, and the motivation for the Medicaid one is efficiency. So the standard Curry-Gruber simulated IV, it, what that uh, approach does is you, for example, if you wanna, you would take a, say Georgia, for example, the state, and then look at all of the other states and you would see how generous Georgia's Medicaid policies are for everyone outside of Georgia. Then you do it for North Carolina and you're kind of constructing this leave out sort of measure. Now there, you're only gonna have state level variation, which means kind of less variation overall if you're looking at individual level outcomes. So when you kind of do the inverse here and you ask about uh, counterfactually, uh, how eligible would this person have been under different policy regimes? So you hold the person fixed and vary the policy. Uh, that gives you a lot more variation. And when you're doing this recentering, you're pulling out the problematic endogenous exposure of that person. So uh, it's mainly a solution. The Curry-Gruber instrument is valid under similar identifying assumptions, but it's a way to get more power. And they actually see a reduction on the order of 60% in terms of the standard errors uh, when going from this newer approach or going from the old approach to the new approach. 
It's also useful for overcoming omitted variable bias in a network setting. So they study an application of a quasi-random uh, expansion of high-speed rail uh, in China. And even when you have a natural experiment, because some places, like very central geographic places, will have a greater likelihood to just be near uh, a train uh, wherever it pops up, uh, that actually creates an endogeneity problem. So it can be useful for correcting that as well. So it can solve two different problems. It's useful for uh, Bartik instruments potentially as well. Uh, there's uh, in the very, towards the end of the paper, they have a nice overview of how it could be applied to a number of other instruments or other quasi-experimental settings. Also mentioned, um, Paul Goldsmith Pinkham has a really fantastic discussion. I think he uh, tweeted his slides a little while ago um, in like the last week or two. So I recommend uh, looking for those slides. It's a really nice introduction to the paper. Well, I have to say, uh, thank you very much, uh, Sasha. We could not have started with a better speaker because I think today we were able to address, first of all, a very important questions. And, you know, um, uh, for all of us who have looked at the debt behavior and how much uh, people carry debt, I think, you know, we have another paper that looks at this with a very interesting angle. Uh, but I deeply enjoy, in particular, learning more about this econometric method and, um, you know, your explanation. We had a big discussion. We had a little bit of a discussion earlier on. So I think this is really an additional benefit of having you as a speaker today. And I really appreciate, in particular, that, you know, in addition to this uh, very nice empirical work and uh, very thorough empirical work, um, you know, you also had the model because, indeed, we need to be a little bit more precise, you know, when we want to identify what is the effect, where, where it is coming from. And, you know, this credit channel, I think, is just such an interesting um, effect and an interesting uh, result of your work. Um, so we are really delighted to have you today. I think, you know, you raise expectations now for everybody. Um, and uh, we are very happy that the Financial Literacy Seminar Series starts with uh, an important questions, a, a really good paper, and uh, some new insight about recenter simulated IV, which is going to be my next read, I have to say, and thank you for suggesting the paper. Um, so thank you um, for all of uh, you that uh, are following this seminar. Uh, thank you for being here with us. We have a really good lineup of seminar speakers this uh, uh, semester and truly delighted that we started with Sasha. So looking forward to the next uh, seminar series um, and um, uh, thank you again for being with us today.